the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Ameen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, the age of all ages, Ameen. Today is the third day of the Feast of the Cross. So, Kulli Salam Tayyibin, Happy Feast of the Cross. And uh, I want to tell you uh, a story about a man named Alexander. Alexander was born in 1918, in December 11th. And um, he won the Nobel Prize no price. Nobel Prize in literature in um, 1970. And this was uh, the citation for the prize. For the ethical force with which he pursued the indispensable traditions of Russian literature. That's what it stands for, but that's why he won the prize, but his story is much more interesting than the citation. So he... Um, he lived during the time when Russia was under the Soviet regime, communism, and in an interview, he really said the main reason behind all of this, all of the suffering, all of the bad things that happened is one reason. Well, the main reason really is men have forgotten God. Men have forgotten God. And that's why all this happened. He was born... Um, in a devout Christian family. His father died in a hunting accident before he was born, and his mother raised him. She was Orthodox, and she raised him in the Orthodox faith, and she encouraged his education, and um, things went well for a while. But then, right before, um, uh, in 1944, right before he joined the army, or uh, rather, right before he got arrested, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, Right before he got arrested, she died. So he died around 1944. And um, so she was with him for a long time, and she raised him well in the Orthodox faith. But like many youth of his time, he lost his faith, and he left it for what everyone was doing at the time and everyone was believing and talking about what the government was pushing, what the state was pushing. And that is a sort of the communist kind of ideology is Marxism and um, Marxism-Leninism. Basically, it's a combination of Karl Marx, if you know anything about German sociology and his, his ideas and how Lenin, or sorry, how Stalin read it in the 1920s. So the combination of these two things gave us what we now know as Russian or Soviet communism. And uh, to them, there were two obstacles to achieve their goal of a socialist paradise, a communist paradise, rather. Uh, to achieve a goal of you know, happiness and prosperity and equality for everyone, there were two opposition, two, two main things that stood in the way. The first one was political opposition. Political opposition was problematic, and anyone who opposed the state politically, they were arrested and sent off and never to be um, heard of again. The second was organized religion. Organized religion was seen as problematic, as something that's going against what the state wants to do, so it was opposed, and many clergy, many priests, and nuns, and monks, many were arrested, also sent to these work camps. And this man, Alexander, he served in the army, he served with distinction, and he got many awards, but as he served, as his service uh, progressed, he became disillusioned. He, became, he began to see that things aren't what the state is claiming them to be, that things aren't going well, that they're not living up to the standard that they said they would live up to, the promises that they made aren't being delivered, aren't being carried forward so he became disillusioned he, he started to think that you know this whole communist thing isn't as it's all it's cracked up to be it's not as good as they made it seem out, seem out to be and he began to write letters to his friends you know, because they didn't have you know phone text messages he began, so he began to write letters to his friends expressing his disappointment expressing his displeasure with the regime with the state with how things are going and of course, all these letters were being monitored and they were being opened and read by the military. So not long after he started writing these letters, he got arrested. And 
what happens is that in the middle of the night, two people show up and they knock on the door. You open the door, they call them you know, the midnight visitors. They open the door and that person is taken, never to be seen, never to be heard of or from again. And then they take them and the first thing they do is make them sign this non-disclosure agreement. An NDA basically in today's lingo where whatever happens in the interrogation, no one is to be told of and you need to sign this before we start the interrogation. So you know it's going to be unpleasant. And after many hours, they always get an admission of guilt for something, for one thing or another, it doesn't really matter. And what ends up happening is that this admission of guilt ends up being useless anyways, because when they show up in court, they tell them, you have to prove to us, it's not that we have to prove that you're guilty, you have to prove to us that you're innocent. You have to prove to us beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have no ill intentions towards the state, which is you know, a useless kind of endeavor to begin with. So everyone who goes before the court gets shipped off to one of those work camps. And in the camps, he was surprised to see that uh, the group that suffered the most, there are many people from many different backgrounds, but the group that really suffered the most were the people who believed in the state the most, believed in their vision, believed in their promises, believed in their dreams. The people who believed the most, these are the people who suffered the most. So whatever they were telling them, and they believed it as much as they suffered the most. And what was surprising is that when they got arrested, they did not uh, renounce their faith in the party, renounce their faith in it. They did not do any of that. In fact, they went, they doubled down, they went the opposite way. They started to think, you know what, maybe we are guilty. And they started to write letters admitting crimes and, and problems and mistakes that they never did and asking for forgiveness and asking for mercy. Of course, they were all useless. They continued, they stayed in jail. And during his time in these work camps, Alexander saw that the problem is that we've entrusted or they've entrusted our God-given soul to a dogma created by man, an idea created by man. And so the prison experience was really uh, not the same for everyone. Some people, like I said, some people suffered more than others, but really it was a place full of corruption and anyone who went in most likely became tainted by it, became corrupt, became evil, became touched by whatever was in that prison, right? whatever that, in that camp. The corruption was, he said, was endemic. It was everywhere. Everywhere there is corruption. Everywhere there are people taking advantage of one another, tricking one another, trying to get the best of, um, of one another. They were designed for this, in fact, but they did not, they were not able to crush everyone. They were not able to get the best of everyone. Some people went through the experience and came out the other end better than when they went in. And he's going to, and he, and he tells us why. He says, for him, imprisonment provided an opportunity to reflect. A painful opportunity, but still an opportunity to reflect, to think about all of the things and all of the decisions that have led to this point. And the fact that he left his faith as a young man to follow along with the faith that was being pushed by the government, by the state at the time. And reflecting on how this was a huge mistake. And it was in the camps that he found his orthodox faith back and he became orthodox again. And he became orthodox before he, he went out and he continued to write and he continued to practice his faith until the day of his death. He bluntly says in his memoirs, bless you, prison, for having crossed my path. Bless you. He blessed his prison experience. He's like, this was amazing. This is, was exactly what I needed. But then some people, when they read this, they said, well, easy for you to say, you survived the prison. What about all those people who didn't survive the prison? Would they also see it as something good? Would they also see it as something blessed? And he responds by something that is very helpful for us to think about. The things that we fear the most, or the things that we fear losing the most, these become our worst enemy. If we fear losing freedom, the loss of freedom becomes 
our master, becomes a tyrant. We sacrifice anything and everything just to stay free. Now replace freedom with anything else. Let's say with money. Let's say with career. Let's say with health. Anything else that we fear losing, that becomes the obstacle that our Lord is talking about today. That becomes the roadblock on, in the way to the kingdom. The obstacle that we cannot overcome because we fear losing it. And the more we fear losing it, the bigger the obstacle becomes. So the question really is, what are we afraid of losing? In the same, uh, the same conversation, the same passage came in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. But in the Gospel of St. Luke, it's even more sharp. Like, whatever you're afraid of losing, what is it that you're afraid of losing? Whatever that is, that becomes the obstacle. It's not anything that uh, you need to do that's a big obstacle or a huge obstacle. It's what you're afraid of losing. So much so that we're willing to sacrifice even the kingdom for the sake of not losing whatever we don't want to lose. So let's, let's say, for example, prosperity. Prosperity is a huge temptation and a huge challenge. Once we have it, when we're afraid to lose it, we begin to sacrifice anything and everything for, in order to keep it, even the kingdom. And we begin to even imagine in our wildest dreams a kingdom without a king, a kingdom where we get to keep everything that we have and still be in the kingdom. Somehow we get to not lose anything and still be able to follow Christ. And Christ is telling us clearly, whatever it is you're afraid of losing, you cannot have two masters. Whatever it is you're afraid of losing becomes your master. And therefore, you follow that master. And you sacrifice me for the sake of that master. And this is what's happening today. When we look, when we look around, we, have, we don't have the same kind of challenges that we read about in the Synexarium. No one is being dragged out of the church and taken out in the middle of the public square and, uh, and tortured and forced uh, to renounce their faith. The challenge is much harder. It's much more difficult. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do, love money. All you have to do is love career. All you have to do is love earthly things. And that's so easy and that's so pleasurable, right? But as soon as we fall into that trap, as soon as we fall into that trap, we begin to realize like this is something now that I'm afraid of losing and that becomes the obstacle to the kingdom, the obstacle that can, I cannot overcome because I cannot imagine my life without these things, without peace, without prosperity, um, without health, without career. I cannot imagine my life. How would my life be without these things? And that's why the gospel is coming to us today and telling us what is it that you're afraid of losing? Once we figure that out, once we put our finger on it, if you know, this is what I'm afraid of losing. That becomes the target of all of my effort. This is what I have to work on. Because as long as I'm afraid of losing this, the kingdom is always going to be out of reach, out of hand. Glory be to God forever and ever.